All righty again. So we're back with uh, part two now of our sketching with animation video lecture here. And in this one, we will go through a lot of different examples and showcase you how these different temporal, uh, temporal sketching techniques can be used to basically um, manifest different design ideas. Some of them will be on the sort of the micro level of our uh, service design um, field, user experience, we could call them, show uh, how you can sketch interfaces. Others will go up to these more um, uh, meso levels where we showcase different touch point, different context. And I'll also show you some of those who go up on the macro perspective of showing entire front and backstage of a service. Um, so again, it will basically be our way of showcasing tools which you can use uh, to accommodate what we talked about in the last lecture here. Tools for basically focusing on what is interesting in your design scenarios. Reflect upon why is it also, what questions do you actually want to raise and how do you actually portray your diegetic prototypes in a design fiction scenario in such a way that people can actually suspend disbelief and in the end, how will you actually reframe? What is it? What kind of questions do you want to resolve or ask or criticize in your scenarios? So it will also be tools to sort of show you that there are many different ways of doing this. And of course, also that implies that we need you to be very aware of that when you do this, you actually need to sort of pinpoint what sort of box in this horizontal vertical mix do you actually want to portray? And one of the questions you've had is, okay, can I combine many different smaller sketches into one file in the end? And the answer to that was, yes, you can. Uh, because that would basically be you showcasing different box, different selection and highlights in the total domain of what your design concept could be. So that might be completely viable. It could also be viable, of course, to showcase many completely different concepts. Both strategies works in this context. Um, and I think I want, uh, I want to emphasize now, which we didn't mention in the last lecture, is since that this education is service design, there is an important sort of emphasis on how not only what meets our users, the front stage, works out, but also what does it require of the stakeholders involved in creating this service. So that is the, the backstage of it all, um, who are involved when are they involved? What are the requirements? Are you all actually also designing systems that will enable the backstage to better accommodate for something happening front stage? And then, of course, we also have that behind the scenes stuff, the business model, the logistics, the um, models of which stakeholders should be involved. Should we out and actually make collaboration with other companies, other services connecting to your service in order to actually make that service value proposition work as you're proposing in whatever design scenario you're building. So remember both the front stage, the backstage, and the behind the stage when you do these things. And um, enough of that. I know you're probably sitting and are very eager to go into work, work. Yes, to work, work mode. Um, so without further ado, I think we should jump in and discuss some different techniques to use inside of Adobe Premiere. And one of the questions I often get is, why don't we use a more sophisticated tool than Adobe Premiere? Adobe Premiere is mostly uh, meant to be a video, a video editing software and not as default meant to be an animation software, for an example. Why don't give us a course in... Adobe After Effects or in uh, some 3D modeling tools or whatever. And there are two reasons for this. One is that Adobe Premiere is a bit easier for many people to learn right out of the box. And that's a prime thing, of course. We can teach it rather fast and you can rather quickly get up and running. The one hour lecture that will come after this one where I showcase how to build a very rough design um, scenario showcases how fast we can actually build something. And when you get the hang of this, then the scenario that I built in an hour together with you in that video lecture will actually be able to be built in uh, maybe 10, uh, 20 minutes of time. I think I have built it in 15 minutes once when I just collected all the resources and put them together. Um, so that's one thing that Premiere is very good at actually get on, getting us into a fast production loop rather fast. 
But another thing is that Adobe Premiere has that ability to actually, on most computers, live render what we're seeing. So that is that if we had used Adobe After Effects, which is much more high fidelity in terms of graphics it can produce, it has a problem of that rather soon, rather fast, you cannot anymore live watch the changes you've just made. You have to constantly render them or RAM render them, what they call in that software. And that's a problem when we talk about that this is sketching because we actually want to constantly see the changes we've made so we can constantly iterate inside of the software without having to export our stuff. And that's a really important thing. And I think that's actually why Adobe Premiere and its free pendant hit film Express are still the two sort of best pieces of software to make these sketching things. Of course, when we dive into video prototypes or video simulations, you can dive into more sophisticated software. But without further ado, the first technique that I want to sort of emphasize was one of the ones I discussed with you in the initial um, introduction to the entire workshop, and that is animatics, the most simple form of animation-based video sketch we can use for creating design fiction out there. And basically, animatics are akin to when you have a storyboard or a graphic scenario that where you try, uh, try to portray something happening over time. And the only thing different here is that you actually take a photograph of each individual frame and put them into a movie timeline and add some sound or text or smaller effects. And um, just to show you it's um, what it can be used for, here we have an example from some students a couple of years ago. Um, who worked with how could they actually use children as sort of becoming the ambassadors of more sustainable um, knowledge about our uh, food production. And they had this wonderful, simple idea of children having sort of a, a journey where they collected information about um, where our groceries come from. And from this group had the idea, so they had created this wonderfully simple animatic it only took less than an hour. So from ideation to communicatable uh, output, 45 minutes or so. Let's see it here. Come Jack, let's go buy some groceries. I'll get the cereal, maybe you can get the carrots. But mom, I just wanna play with my phone. Ah, oh, stupid carrots. Huh? What is this? Scan the label and hear the story about how the vegetables is produced. That looks interesting. Let me try that. Oh wow, there's a lot more to these carrots than I thought. There you are. Did you find the carrots? Let's go home and make dinner. So, have you experienced anything fun today? Yes, did you know that these carrots are produced by a local farmer named Peter? And that it takes Peter around two to three months to grow these wow. carrots. Jack really learned a lot from scanning that label at the supermarket. Yeah, every year there is a character in one of the movies called Peter. Wonder why? Um, but I hope you can see here, even though it's, in, again, it's not Hollywood uh, acting, it's just students making a voiceover here, and it's definitely not Hollywood fidelity in terms of the visuals, it communicated rather well a user journey of using this kind of app targeted at children to get them actually engaged in conversations about sustainability and where our groceries come from. And it's so simple, and it was created in no time. The, the true production time is 25 minutes or so, and the group spent 20 minutes discussing the idea, basically. And just to show you how quick it can be done, here you, I, I came up and drew, uh, drew on an iPad here, a very um, simple um, example, too. Um, which could be an idea for you could actually uh, set your mood and then download an app and uh, get some food because that's what everybody should do right now to support our takeaways uh, places and our restaurants. And the idea here, I don't actually know what the idea really was, but it was that instead of driving to the restaurant, you would get an e-coupon uh, afterwards, which would um, enable you to actually get uh, deliveries afterwards for a reduced price so you could actually support the delivery companies. Again, it's, it's not a good idea. Um, but you can see here a few frames, and then I basically just uh, put them in, and I recorded some sound with my phone, and in five minutes I got this uh, uh, coupon-based animatic produced. 
Mm, what is this? Oh, something I can uh, download. Yes. Mm. <laughs> oh, this looks very nice. I will place an order. Yes. Oh. Some okay. Some time will happen. Yes. Nice. 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 Okay. I know when I went to deliver. We're gonna went to pick up it. Yes. I'm so hungry. Oh, a coupon arrived. This is very, very timely. What a nice service. So good food. Yes, besides that, I can take over from uh, Rowan Atkinson when he did. Uh, goes on uh, retirement from being Mr. Bean. You can see here that even though this was a really bad design idea, then it is really quickly to convey something if we just use still images and use them over the course of time and then add sound. Actually, we don't need more to communicate ideas, especially when they are so early. Because now we could begin to request, okay, there are some specific details that I don't get here. What happens? Uh, does it get the coupon at the restaurant? What is the service touch point here? Um, okay, what about if he actually uh, already had a coupon, would he just could be able to accumulate more coupons? There would be many questions we could begin to ask, and then we could make a new variation of the sketch, maybe in a higher fidelity, maybe with stop motion, but where we could basically begin to dive into the details of this concept. And that's what we're looking for, especially when we use animatics. That is the early, very broad, diverging questions that we basically want to explore further in our design fictions. And for those of you who, I know each year there are some people who say they're not comfortable uh, drawing and stuff like that. Again, it doesn't have to be pretty. But there are some uh, nice tools out there that you can use, um, something like Comic Live, in which you can sort of make real comic book uh, layouts and use uh, filters on top of still images to basically make something look like a drawn comic. And then you can photograph the pages and make an animatic out of it. And there is software like a Storyboard That, which is basically a drag and drop uh, piece of software where you can drag and drop different uh, people, different environments, different furnitures, and they actually create uh, storyboards. Um, it has its own distinct style. I'm not sure that I'm a great fan of it, but again, it actually holds some potentials for showcasing things in sort of this drawn uh, fidelity without it being hand drawn. So that might actually be something that could be used afterwards, not just internally, but actually also as an external thing on a uh, idea portal on the web or something like that. So there is some merit in using digital drawing tools, definitely. Now for one of the techniques that we often see, in, especially in this workshop, that is one of the most popular because it's so easy, but also because it is very, very powerful and often very much more powerful than we would actually think in at the initial get-go and that is stop motion that is an age-old uh, animation technique basically uh, defined by that we take a picture and then move something be it a cut out paper figure as you see to the left a or a lego figure or a piece of clay for that matter the important part is we move them just a tiny fraction then we take a picture then we move them a tiny fraction take a picture move, take a picture, move, take a picture, etc. And then when we've done that enough, we get the illusion of motion, basically, and of change over time. And the strength of stop motion is, as you will see in the next video, where we do the follow along in Adobe Premiere, or in one of the shorter 20 minute uh, guide videos on, um, on YouTube, you can find on Moodle. It's really, really fast. And it's really, really easy to actually create these things. And uh, I, I'm just going to want to show you a couple of examples here from the previous yeah, years of workshop. One of them here is a uh, group of students a couple of years ago who uh, worked with a company called Visuaid, who works with uh, creating assistive tools for uh, people with disabilities. And here it was the cane for blind people, the cane that they use to actually find their way. And they research how to put Internet of Things technologies, sensors, inside of this cane, which would enable it to communicate with its surroundings. And they use Legos and some cardboard city uh, mock-up to show a one of the first scenarios they build. Let's just see it really quickly here. Walk 10 meters. 
this bus stop, you can take bus number 5 and 3. From this bus stop, you can take bus number 17. So wonderful, right? It, it, it's so simple and so low fidelity that everyone can see that this is a sketch. But the idea it communicates is rather sharp. So its focus is really, really great here in terms of the model. It really helps us focus on, okay, what if we could just point the cane towards objects via some kind of sonar and you would instantaneously get some audio feedback, maybe in an, um, a headset or something. But there are also things that, uh, because of the fidelity that it asks some interesting questions, I remember we discussed a lot with the groups, okay, how would this pointing actually work? And if you're blind and point with your cane, wouldn't you actually have the risk of hitting someone with the cane? How would we solve that? So they developed another version where they had this idea of actually holding down a button while you were just holding the cane down the, to the ground and using it sort of a, as a sonar radar scanner thing. So again, a way of showing how an early, very rough idea can, can still provoke all the right design questions. Um, and basically just by figuring out some really, really rudimentary things. We don't even have to be that good at drawing to communicate an idea here. Rather quickly, we can communicate motion, we can communicate feelings, we can communicate context with a few lines drawn, basically. And especially if we use some stuff like cutouts, where it's basically two-dimensional, and we maybe photograph it inside some kind of constrained environment so we don't have to think about oh how much can I actually do here now if we have a constrained environment such as an A4 page and then begin to cut out and uh, tell our story we can actually tell some rather complex things and rather compelling things really fast like this next stop motion example with some service design students working with the Dis distortion festival in which they um, had this idea of how could we design a guiding system for distortion, which would show in a more dynamic way when some kind of music would be played at what street and what had been playing and what was playing right now. And they came up with this idea of sound bubbles and wanted to communicate it and make this wonderful stop motion sketch in half an hour or so. And let's try to see it. So, again, really simple and the basics of the idea, the basic what-if question shown in a scenario here. And again, this one focused on all the right things, showing us, okay, there are some kind of bubbles that are pulsating. And some of the questions asked by their classmates were, mm, how will I know which bubble is what? Is it is a future event, a current event, or something that happens after two events? So they came up with an, uh, in another video, for an example, experimenting, what about colors? Or what about different kind of pulses? Or um, what about that the pulses were more active if you were closer to the concerts? And different ways of sort of portraying this kind of navigation that they were looking for. And again, 20, 25 minutes of production time here. It was really, really a clever use of stop motion. And it can be much more sophisticated, like... This one, where you actually try to show some actually inter interaction um, with an app. And you can see you're combining it with where is he, and then they combine it actually. They just have some green screen in the background of this stop motion and combine it with some video footage to basically simulate it being used inside of the context. Um, and they combine it with some real footage of the user too. This is an idea bank where healthcare personnel can submit ideas to how to improve their uh, working environment. Når der vi har en alarm, så er det simpelthen for langsomt at komme fra A til B. Det har jeg været ude og prøve at se, om jeg kan finde en løsning på. Øhm, og det jeg har fundet ud af, det er, at man kan have nogle...
So again, it's a wonderfully simple way of communicating actually rather complex uh, service ideas in context here. Um, combining fidelities here, and again, this is done in a lot shorter time than would have been spent creating a mock-up, testing the mock-up in a real-life uh, scenario, or filming it in a real-life scenario and then sharing it. This is, again, much more primitive, but it communicates the idea rather well, at least if you ask me. And just to show you a, a stop motion in a bit longer service journey here, here we have some uh, students working with Grundfos about how to improve concepts of gamification together with a circular economy, how to basically reuse old pumps in new ways. And they created this also very, very rough, very low fidelity stop motion, but which again communicates a rather complex concept. And as you can see here, actually in the end it becomes rather, literally many moving parts they actually show. And again, they reuse many of the elements they already had in order to actually tell the story with the few assets they needed and then ended up actually showcasing a very long service journey with many touch points, many stakeholders in, in play here. And actually Grundfos, a serious Danish industrial company, ended up using this one of their sketches actually to showcase to different design groups internally to actually begin to discuss circular economy. So it goes to show we should not be that afraid of fidelity. Fidelity is basically just something that many people, many professionals at least, can easily look beyond uh, if just it communicates and asks all the right questions and sort of makes us focus on the design idea. Um, same goes here. This is a... Uh, video of a uh, industrial company who works with uh, sort of using sensors to uh, make sure that uh, machines on um, construction sites are not damages and how they re should be repaired in a more orderly fashion. Again, using very simple rough fidelity to communicate a really nice Internet of Things idea here. So it just goes to show that we can really achieve something rather neat with stop motion. Um, and this low fidelity stuff that you can actually just draw by hand. Um, they had colored it on the uh, on the computer, which I think works um, wonderful here. Um, and I've killed the sound to be able to uh, talk over it, but it actually communicates this, uh, they call it the hero concept, basically. And I think it is um, really, really neat um, in communicating the idea. And, I, and again, don't be afraid of the fidelity. If the idea is good enough, if it is communicated good enough, then people can easily see past the fidelity, most of the times at least. So there are multiple ways of doing stop motion. In the uh, video lecture, uh, you'll see after this one, you'll see how to do it with hundreds of still images. So if you just took images by your phone uh, independently, there is also the option of using this software called Stop Motion Studio. It is free-ish. There's a premium version too. Um, but you can download a free version to both iOS and Android phones. And it enables you to both uh, capture all the images. You can actually convert it into a stop-motion movie right inside of the um, of the software. And it enables you, you can see the, the slider in the left side of the phone screen here. That's what they call an onion skin. And that essentially enables you to, that when you record things, if you slide the slider down half, 
you will be able to see sort of a semi-transparent image of the previous image you captured. So you'll constantly be able to see sort of where is your motion going. So you know just enough about how far or how uh, much you can actually move the figure, whatever you're doing, um, to the next frame. So that is the software side. One of the issues that we will have, because this is virtual and you're all sitting at home and you're not sitting together with your groups, is that normally when we would do this on class, I would have a lot of these boxes called stand scans, which are basically cardboard boxes with a hole cut in the top uh, for your phone and where there is an LED uh, lighting strip inside. And in that way, we have this constrained environment, which basically gives you an A4 space to begin to create your sketches within and having your phone fixed in a fixed position. That's a really important part because if you don't fix your phone, then you will be able to see that everything moves around um, between each take you take. And usually I have 25 of these to give to, uh, around to the groups, but um, this year we can't do that. And this year you can't be sitting like this and collaborate on it in this way. So we have to find an, sort of an alternative to this. Especially, first of all, an alternative to the boxes, because I know that you will probably... Uh, maybe some of you already be thinking now that, Jesus Christ, this is just an <coughs> situation, right? Um, that we don't have these, and how can we do this without the hardware? And there are two ways we can go about this. The simplest way is, of course, to accommodate with just what we have. Here is an example of a workshop I held with some children on teaching them animation, um, not in a design context, but in how to actually use design or storytelling in uh, in different uh, courses in the Danish uh, school system. And here we basically just used a tablet and a table and then produced everything on the floor, basically, and then tried to arrange everything as good as we could. Be very careful when you do this, that when you push the record button, that you don't push your phone or tablet over the edge, maybe put a a, uh, a book or something on the other end as a counterweight. This can work. It can be an, an okay solution. The problem, again, is lighting. The lighting will change constantly in there. It, it, it can work, but it is not the best solution. I came up with another idea. That since we're all uh, at home right now, and maybe many of, you, many of you in your maybe in your cellar or something, that you have an old card box that you used when you moved into your apartment. Or maybe you have gotten one of these uh, meal boxes from Austizene or Nemli.com or any other kind of company that we actually should support with some money these day and age. We could also build our own basic stand scan here. And I tried to do it here at home. Uh, I found a box from Austizene in my closet and uh, tried to figure out, can we actually uh, create our own stand scans. Like that. So a uh, wooden box, uh, which had uh, luckily a hold already. I put it in some cardboard to make sure that it wouldn't scratch my table. Um, but this could might have well have been a box from a movement company. The one that would have been a bit uh, bigger, but we could just have zoomed in. And it... Uh, could have been a box for A4 paper. It could have been anything. As long as it can basically hold maybe a piece of green um, or blue or purple paper. Maybe you just print a piece of full-size uh, paper in a color. And basically to make it easier to replace the background with some green screening. And then make a hole in it big enough so you can actually also use your phone's light. The light on your phone, the blitz basically, uh, to light up the image then we basically have what is needed to replace this with something homemade. And I will guarantee you that it will work just as fine, um, at least for, for sketching purposes here. Here's the other idea that if you have one of these boxes or maybe go down to the bookstores before they all close down and buy a box of A4 paper, then you can basically reuse that box that you get all the paper in to create these stands. So again... Remember, even though it is a bit improvised, then the rule is it has to be fast, not perfect. 
And if you do this, if you create one of these boxes, I promise you that the production time of creating stop motion will be basically cut in half. One of the biggest issues is always to actually figure out a way to fixate everything and having it in a sort of fixed position. So if we can do this, we can do stop motion, and then we can already do a lot of sketching. Now, of course, we can always also do some things inside of the video editing software itself, and that's when we work with video layers and work with what we call keyframed animation. We'll get back to that a uh, tomorrow in the in the video, um, in the other video lecture after this one. But video layers are basically when we exploit, for an example, green screen or exploit that we have graphics uh, we've created on the computer and we place it on top or in the background or in the foreground on other pieces of video. And here is an example of uh, some students who worked with recreational therapy, having sort of imagined a machine which would have a counterweight and then you could use it if you had a, had a stroke to actually train with a more gamified and more virtual uh, sort of interactive uh, tool than normal weight lifts. See here, it's in Danish I'm afraid, but uh, the visuals should show you. So the first one is something up. You should imagine this is a giant magnet which has a lot of resistance um, in which we start out with something simple. Just go for where the, the dots are. And then they begin to elaborate other ways of doing this. And they use some horrible music to that. And they show a lot of traditional recreational therapy uh, ways of doing this at first, but it becomes really interesting when they begin to implement games, for example. Because here they actually just screen captured, um, they just screen captured a game of chess from their computer and then matched the motion of the mouse with these chess boards uh, with the movement on top of a green screen that he actually just moved this. And in this way, they simulate rather well how this recreational therapy thing could actually be used as a gamified device. So you can actually raise the sort of um, desirability for using it. Or one like this in which he traces a line. It's a bit hard to see here, but it actually becomes more solid when he traces the line. And they also do it with, uh, in the end of the video, with what if you could uh, do this with um, drawing. So be creative, so actually begin to do motions that are uh, independent of something pre-made by uh, the recreational therapist. You can see here, you can see the cursor behind it. They're actually just drawing inside of paint, but it works rather well to sort of communicate the idea. But of course, we can also use uh, video layers to basically show detailed interactions on the micro level inside of the context that the user is. This is from Naturmødet, a festival uh, for culture and uh, nature, where we have uh, an app concept. Don't make app concepts all the time, but again. You can see here they basically show a rather detailed mock-up that they made, but they elaborate it inside of the design scenario here by actually showing it in context. Here it's at the home, so not much context here, but at least it shows us it's a different place than at the festival itself. And then later on, we showcase a sort of simulated uh, walk in the park where this user will begin to use the software in a new way, depending on where the, his context is. So actually a great way of showing a mobily enriched uh, service journey here. The other one here is uh, one uh, made for, I think it was actually Grundfos. Um, in which they again combine elements they made in Photoshop and some stop motion here. Today we're going to talk about a new challenge announced by a company called Confus. Oh yeah, it is a uh, concept where children should participate in actually learning about sustainability through a concept that Confus would give to schools. Use these pumps and help the environment. This is called the pump. He needs help finding his way home. Even though the old pumps, just like him, don't have the reuse logo on them, they still want to go home and feed... And you can see here, they basically placed the so stop motion elements on top of this graphic that they made inside of, um, of Photoshop. 
and the, the video uh, lecture where we show the follow along in Premiere will show you all about how these video layers work. Um, but again, the simple way of sort of showcasing uh, the scenario in here, you can see another video layer they showed and they made this GIF of this boy and you can see they animate a building coming closer to him in the background. So everything happens in a front, middle and background basically when we work in this way. And the last one I want to show you here is a bit more complex. It is uh, Van der Beek et al. Uh, some design students who used this together with the research project in which they actually wanted to show how a blockchain-based data model for friendships could work. And that's extremely abstract to actually communicate how does a blockchain work. So they chose to sort of exaggerate and show an visual model of the data that this uh, user would, would be um, interacting with, basically. So um, they kind of uh, show our user and they show her interacting through voice with her uh, blockchain model, which would arrange how she should actually um, differentiate between her friends, between the uh, agreements uh, with them, disagreements and stuff like that. And since she ends up uh, talking to this uh, blockchain and ask it to adjust the friendship model. And then they use some clever small video annotations to show us the idea that it actually uh, adjusts the um, blockchain model here. And um, you can see here, you can actually do this by yourselves, even the, though that uh, that she talks about her friends, they're only her, and then she uses uh, some clever effects as to show, okay, a digital model has now been created. And this is what happens inside of the blockchain system. So we can also use this method to basically um, exaggerate how reality looks, but then actually communicate what happens inside of this algorithm. Um, so that is video layers, basically. The next one, and mo probably the most complex one for us to accommodate and use here in this workshop, is green screening. And the reason, of course, that this is complex is that Green screening is when we enact things in front of a green, a blue, or a purple, that doesn't actually matter, but a very contrastful background in order for us to use our video software to make it transparent. So we can put in a video layer in the background. That could be a still image, but it could also be a graphical elements we've created to simulate something inside a context. And usually we use it to either simulate the backdrop, where are we, or we use it to simulate products that should be sort of looking like that they are in the context that our uh, enactment happens. Like um, like this, for an example, where we have some students who thought of a solution to sort of an intelligent system for a sense gardens at the recreational homes in which a some chips in the wheelchairs would register with these kiosks and interact uh, possibly where you could actually begin to uh, adjust experiences for the users in the garden. You can see here, none of this is filmed in a real garden and the box there is just drawn, I think, in PowerPoint. And you can see our user here walks in front of it suddenly and it makes it look like she's actually interacting. And we zoom in. And they have a very rudimentary interface, basically, about how to adjust the sounds in this sense garden. But the important part was that we more se rather seamlessly sort of showcased how we came from the context and into the details of the interaction here. Um, you can see here. And it looks a bit rough, but again, it is a sketch and it works rather neatly. Another one here oh, is a bit more high fidelity. Um, that is some students who work with uh, one of the new super hospitals being built here in Northern Jutland. And uh, they were asked to imagine how will the hospital of the year 20, 25, uh, 35, 2035 look like? What kind of intelligent technologies could we be using to both control the hospital bed, the hospital's environment? And um, they found a very futuristic image of a hospital and then put one of their uh, co-students on a green sheet basically and then they simulated that he had been had his legs amputated and needed to control the context.
So all of this happens at a green screen. Hello. Hello. Der kommer ikke nogen hjælp til Albert. Der er færre hænder til at varetage de samme opgaver. Oh, 30, yeah. som der var 33. Arbejdsstyrken er blevet mindre, og samtidig er ældrebyrden blevet langt større. Det her er ikke værdigt. Vi introducerer et multimodalt system, hvor brugerne vælger, hvordan patienterne kan interagere med produktet gennem stemmestyring, so tracking voice control, basically. They are telling in Danish now. Systemet sikrer inddragelse af patientens ressourcer, aktivering og mobilisering, samtidig med at det sparer personalet på afdelingen for de praktiske opgaver ved hjælp af automatisering. Værdighed Nærvær og effektivitet er nøgleord, som direkte taler til de tre brugergrupper, patienten, plejeren og indkøberen. Systemet består af flere integrerede dele. Informations- og videoskærm, briller. So right now we have a voiceover, and I would argue they could have done without it. They should just jump straight to actually showcasing it in context, as you'll see in just a few seconds. Det er i dag den 25. september 2035. Det er skyfrit, og der er 15 grader. Computer, vi sminder gæld. Okay, der er stuegal 510. So you can see here, they animate some different layers on top of this green screen background, and they change the perspective. Hej, Albert. And then they also show a model of how this new intelligent bed will work for the company they uh, collaborated with, Gulman. But I hope you could see that all of this happened in a completely simulated environment, but in a rather both high fidelity way, but also very, very uh, designerly way, begins to show us the interactions in this kind of everyday conventional life. He actually just interacts like, okay, this is actually just how I should interact. I can make the drapes for the window uh, remove, I can interact with my daily planner, and the sketch goes on to also show how he, by himself, comes down into his wheelchair. So that's the strength of, uh, of using green screen, that we can do endless amounts of things because we can make that transparent background. But of course, since it usually looks like this when we do it, this was the last year when the, they tried to simulate a service journey where the user was uh, bicycling through Copenhagen through all of the different touch points of their service. Of course, the challenge is that we won't have access to that kind of green screen setup as we have in normally in the studio. But hopefully we can manage still. And the first thing is that we don't need the color to be green. Basically, everything that has a strong contrast to what we want to show in front of it can work because uh, green screen effects basically works with giving a sort of a tolerance where we mathematically tell the software, as I'll show you in the next video, how it should interpret what is actually going to be made transparent. So the important part is we have some rather contrastful colors, blue, green, uh, purple, pink, and in some cases also a uh, sort of bright red. But of course it goes to say that uh, depending on what people are wearing or what kind of things you put in front of the camera, um, you need to choose your background accordingly, or at least choose what the actors or elements you're showing will be accordingly. Because if you put even a darker nuance of green in front of a green screen, it will easily become transparent. The same goes for red across red, blue across blue, etc. But this is where this workshop will be very interesting this year, because there are many ways to do this. Maybe you won't be able to film an entire scene with you in front of a green screen, but maybe you could actually show something where it is just from your torso and up. Maybe we have something that is big enough to make that work. So it's all about being creative here. Do you have some red towels laying around or do you have an air mattress maybe or a um, something green that is large, maybe a sheet for a something or do you have a blue tent from uh, Roskilde festival which in an unassembled way could actually maybe create a one times one meter of blue screen so basically it will all be about being as creative as possible with what we're going to do especially with green screen but that's also why i showed you with the stand scans that if you 
make the exercise of actually having a green screen in front of your stop motions. Green, blue, purple, whatever. If you don't have it, then try to print. And if you don't have a printer, then maybe go down and try to find something in a bookstore or find something from a magazine or something. Or maybe uh, the backdrop from a, a sleeve from a laptop which has a bright color. Because if you do that, we can already use green screens in stop motion videos. Uh, like this one where we actually have placed both the stop motion and some real footage from a close-up. So this could be done in front of a very small green screen. Here they have sort of an augmented reality Pokemon Go-ish thing for a, a natural park where you should be able to register different animals that you spot. Um, in an index here, gotta catch them all, basically. Um, so basically this um, this can work in this way. It... Um, and this is also a way of showing, okay, now I actually know how to work with green screens because I can place these stop motion elements inside a real park, basically. Um, and depending on what you want to show in the background, I'm also often giving the uh, advice to not sometimes not go out, especially not now, go out and film everything because you will spend a lot of time. Sometimes you might actually just go into uh, YouTube and if you want to show something happening at a concert, you might just write rock concert on YouTube. And then you can use a tool like this one, Y2 Made, for example, to download the video and then place it in the background layer on the video you're going to make. And this is most of the times fine, but be sure to recognize, acknowledge the uh, copyright of the ones that you use materials from. Be sure to check if the license on YouTube is actually Creative Commons so you can... Uh, reproduce some of the things. There is a lot of freely available stuff out there, which just requires that in your credit scenes that you actually credit the ones who have made the stuff. Um, and if everything else fails, then uh, make the video hidden or be mindful that it is for internal use only. But it is a really good thing. Try to figure out, try to find things that people already have made, especially when you want to show a hospital bed of the future, for example, or a background of a concert or other things. Don't let things constrain you if you can find them out there. And speaking of tools that are out there, there are also some rather nice animation tools that are free-ish available to be used um, on the internet. And I've linked to some of them on Moodle. And the, one of them is Videoscribe. It basically lets us emulate sort of this pen scribe where it looks like something is being drawn in real time. I've seen some Rather neat examples of this being used in video sketches too, like this one. You can see here, this is the same case as uh, the one with the Pokemon Go for uh, nature. And this works rather neatly. It's kind of this um, explain a video kind of way. But again, there is something about this this thing. It becomes a bit more didactic. It becomes a bit less sketchy in some kind of way. So I would consider using mediums like this, but I would also strongly encourage you not only to use a medium like this, to also try out stuff like animatics and the stop motion techniques. Even though Videoscribe here is great and it is free-ish and the only limitation is that you get this watermark down here, but it's completely fine. And there are multiple of these things. There's also a tool like Powtoons. Does something uh, like it here. You have something where they made a service concept for an incubator. You can see here they have these generic, they, all of these different tools have sort of their own characteristic aesthetic to them. Um, and you might like them or you might hate that aesthetic. But uh, again, it, it makes it easy and fast to do something that is okay. And that is rather good in communicating things. But it goes to say that you have less freedom here. You have less freedom to actually come up with your own sort of style and your own sort of way of exaggerating that exact detail you want to have in focus. And you can see some here, sometimes it actually becomes a bit comical and uncanny, some of the things that these characters are doing when they are rolling around. But Powtoons might be a good tool for some of you. And again, I would encourage you to check out the, uh, the tools, especially if you have problems during the workshop with either the green screening or uh, stop motion because of the constraints of the corona. Yeah, we have one more here, Go Animate, which is also has this free trial. 
again, a different aesthetic, but many of the same things are present that we can create some animated characters within some restrictions, place them in a context, and then actually animate them in some situations. Here we have uh, some students working with uh, how to add more data-driven uh, technology in fitness centers. Maybe this year it should be reframed to how to work with it at uh, fitness at a distance, for example. Um, and as I also showed you in a previous uh, video, Prezi, the slideshow software, has also been used to make these more uh, sort of macro-level descriptions of an entire uh, service journey where you can zoom in and maybe later on jump into a specific touch point and show the details of that. Um, I've seen this used a number of times and I think Prezi is awesome at this. The only thing you have to basically have to do is to record your screen. Um, on Windows PCs you can use the uh, Xbox game bar, I think it's called, or uh, another piece of software. You write, just write Windows screen caption, there's multiple software. On a Mac you can do it directly from QuickTime. Just open QuickTime and open archives and then choose uh, make screen recording, then you can record your entire screen. It's what I'm doing right now. Um, and of course, you can use software like Storyboard that, that I just showed you to do animatics. And you can also do it way more simple. There are, there are tons of ways. We haven't even covered a half of what I've seen of different techniques. And every year in this workshop, we see new techniques emerge, new ways, new creative ways of doing animation-based sketches. So you shouldn't also be afraid to push the limit and try to say, okay, could we actually just use Keynote or PowerPoint and record some animations there? That might actually be a good idea if you wanted to show something like how data flows, for example. Simple animation made here in Keynote or in Photoshop if we wanted to show data. And then we could elaborate it on this one where we actually showed the sketch from before. How data flows from one point where they make a review and how it flows into a server to be used by some other personnel. So it can actually, even though it looks very simple and is made in PowerPoint, it can actually do something rather neat for our communication of our service concept here. And showcase, okay, now it pops up and is available to use for another person. Or something like this one. This was uh, something we did when we discussed the circular economy with the Grundfos people, where it actually shows the value chain by only using here uh, PowerPoint animations. But again, it, uh, with a bit of narration, this might actually showcase how uh, these things can actually be used. And it is a complex service economy we just show here with where the flow of money and goods are actually going and how they are actually used to repurpose building materials. So again, push the envelope here. Really try to think of how could you best visualize these things? And of course, the question also is that should we only use video? Is video always the best tool here? And of course, it depends. You can see here that the right answer is probably no, the, there is no one video technique that is always the most viable way. You can see these different uh, examples we've shown in the last hour here. There are many ways of doing it, and it's hard to pinpoint which is the right one. So it has to do with building up some experience with this, building up basically a repertoire of do's and don'ts. And there is no shortcut to that experience. You just have to do it a lot of times. And of course, it also goes to say that maybe you start out now in the groups, scribbling things down, doodling things on traditional paper, and maybe then begin to plan things on a storyboard and then film that storyboard into an animatic. Um, so even though that we have higher fidelity in video sketches, we also have a bit lower for their flexibility in terms of uh, traditional pen and paper sketches. So it's not a sort of a substitute, it is an addition. It's a way of supporting the already existing ways we visualize and represent design. Here we just have to represent things over the course of time, temporal things. But it goes to say, when you try out these techniques at home, remember what wise old Bill Buxton uh, usually says that uh, everything is always best at something and worst at something else. And that might be some of the reflections you could have in your exam papers, actually. How did this tool work? And why did it work well? Or if it didn't work, 
why didn't it work well? Was it because of the design problem wasn't appropriate? This is not a good tool to show interfaces, for an example? Or uh, was it because that you actually had an idea that was so complex to represent um, in a sketch that you actually would have to build it in order to actually showcase it? That kind of reflections could be good. So again, don't panic. I have seen really great uh, projects come out of this who went only along with animatics and stop motion. I've also seen great projects where people use their prior skills in 3D and different stuff like that to create some really neat and beautiful things. But the rule basically goes that always, every year, the best concepts are the ones who actually create a good piece of design fiction. That is, actually create a storytelling framework, creates a story world, and inside that story world, place some kind of technology or a service journey and be very transparent about the subplots about how is that a, this actually a good thing? Are we exploring some kind of possible scenario or a desirable or less desirable scenario? What could go wrong and how would we actually address that for the user? And also who is very transparent about what questions do we actually want the ones watching this design fiction scenario have? What kind of reflection do we want to promote? Those are always the best scenarios, regardless of fidelity, regardless of how many small errors there will be. Um, so again, it is a question of fast, not perfect. If you're acting out by yourself, showcasing uh, healthcare situations, like which is very um, relevant right now, through role-playing, that might be hard when you're dislocated, but who knows, maybe you can find an interesting way to actually do acting things where you act different scenes and then combine them to actually make it seem that you were in the same room when you acted something out. At least try to think of ways to communicate your scenarios. And as I told you uh, also in another video, in the ucrack.dk uh, under concepts, there is over 600 different video sketches collected from the years. Um, both in very low fidelity and in very high fidelity and in very good quality and very bad quality, some which ask some excellent design uh, questions and some which ask some really crappy design questions. So if you need some inspiration, both to the techniques, but also to how to actually arrange these scenarios, you can go look in there. But be mindful that I have yet to see um, this workshop because that is interaction designers come up with really, you know, the golden design fiction, the, the good critical reflection. I hope that's uh, service designers who can really take that critical stance too. So hopefully, even though we won't see many situations like, uh, like this this year, um, then hopefully we'll still be able to actually see a lot of creative techniques used. And uh, one thing about it, when you do your sketches is also you probably have seen now how the role of sound actually changes a lot of what we're doing. So I've put on some links both on Moodle and here on the slides for how to actually uh, find some free available sources both for music but especially also for sound effects especially this one down here my instance has a lot of different oh I can actually see I doubled this two times um, my instance has a lot of really weird design, uh, sound effects, but you can often find some thing to use. So, remember, to sum up here, it is not about Hollywood effects. It's about creating something that can ask the right design questions. It is really important that you get to test as many raw ideas as possible, either different concepts or different variations of whatever concept you come up with. And... Again, this is a course about service representation. So don't stick to the tool that you're most, most comfortable with. Try things out. Try to come out of your comfort zone and actually test some things out. Combine techniques and really push the envelope and reflect upon it. And then I cannot emphasize this enough. Make sure to save everything. Everything you create. And not just because that the software can crash, but also because in your portfolio it might be a good idea to be able to showcase all the different assets you used when you do, did some cutout stop motion versus all the digital aspect, uh, assets you did when you did Premiere or made something in Photoshop that you later on animated. Save everything. So um, 
This might seem a bit daunting. Now I've been talking for one hour, uh, showcasing you a lot of different examples. I also showed more examples than I usually do, but I think it's beneficial because we cannot sit in a room and, and actually discuss this. So I have to just show you as much as possible now. And I want to leave you with sort of this thought, uh, one of my favorite quo quotations from good old uh, Bruce Lee, that there is no shortcut to experience here. It will be very hard for many of you to do this in the first couple of sketches. There will be a lot of buttons that you don't know what to do with. And there will be a lot of things where you say, I, I did as he did on the video, but the software simply don't want to do as I want to do right now. Um, don't hesitate to uh, um, contact me, ask for help. We can do some screen sharing and hopefully we can solve the problem by then. Maybe use TeamViewer to actually let me control your mouse if uh, we are completely stuck. And then remember this uh, Bruce Lee quotation that uh, you should never fear a man who has practiced 10,000 kicks once, but fear the man who practiced one kick 10,000 times. There is no shortcut to doing this other than actually just trying it a lot of times. And hopefully you will get a quite far. I know you will get quite far in just one week here. So the next step now, maybe take a break because you've listened to me for an hour or so. But the next step is basically to watch video lecture seven, where I do a follow along design of a rather cheesy video sketch concept. It's a dating concept. So it's really, really cheesy. It's unpurposely made. So it's very really low fidelity and a rather crappy design idea. But you should be able to follow along. We combine both stop motion, green screen, um, video layers, and a combination of them in creating this sketch. And it takes about one hour or so. Um, and you can use the four part uh, video series that is also linked on Moodle, where I, in smaller 20 minute slots, show you how to do green screen, and in 20 minutes, how to do stop motion, and in 20 minutes, how to do uh, keyframe animation and stuff like that. Use it as sort of a reference throughout the workshop. And um, when you've run through the video lecture seven, here's my proposal basically for what to do next. Um, that's where the group work hopefully starts. So basically begin to ask what concept ideas would you turn into a series of design fiction scenarios? Maybe you use the design fiction matrix. Maybe you use some other tools, some uh, service blueprints or whatever you're already using in your semester projects. Um, and then you will begin to discuss how you actually will arrange the logistics of actually producing this stuff. Do you each make a video and uh, sketch them and then discuss them afterwards? Or do you produce parts of the final video, uh, or not the final video, or produce parts, individual parts of the videos and then combine them? So you actually collaborate on all the sketches. Um, that's completely up to you, um, how you arrange your process. And then from now on at, until tomorrow, Wednesday, um, you should gradually begin to transition into actually producing your first animation-based design fiction videos. And remember, just ask, either write or call me in uh, the Discord channel and we will figure it out. Hopefully it will run more or less seamless. And do share if you find a very creative way of doing something, some very neat ways of uh, figuring out how to do green screen at home or a smarter way of doing a stop motion box than I came up with. Take a picture and share it in our channels on Discord so everyone can be inspired and help each other to actually make this virtual sketching workshop uh, work well. So that's actually uh, that's actually it for now. Um, so uh, let's get cracking and um, it's uh, basically uh, work, work. it's work work time. So um, let's uh, let's leave it at that now and. Um, Again, maybe I'll upload a few more smaller videos, depending on which questions I get, where I show some more specific sketching techniques or how to solve a commonly uh, arising problem if they arise. But um, fingers crossed that there won't be too many of those. So um, with that in mind, I think I will uh, let you all get, uh, get back to it. So um, happy sketching, everyone.